today I've decided that we've kind of done enough for the basics of the industry and maybe it's getting a little too dull and you want to get your hands dirty. So today, and I think I gave a lot of information last time. So today is a little more gentle and it's more of a exploration around what it is to be a storyteller and some of the tools you've got available. So today is a little bit about inspiration and then a little bit about seeing how things used to be. Um, and there's only three of you as well, so maybe I'll talk through a little more about the clips. And if you have a questions, then, then please ask. And I think uh, Professor Shakura has got some questions lined up for you guys as well at some stage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay so as usual, I'm going to play you a little inspirational clip at the beginning. <laughs> So, Kevin Kelly, the co-founder of Wired Magazine, has this wonderful idea about how the emergence of language was actually the first singularity, right? In other words, the world on the other side of that line after language emerged would have been unimaginable to the creatures standing on the previous, on the other side of that line, right? Trying to explain the nuances of a Shakespearean sonnet to an ape are simply unimaginable, right? This is inconceivable. We simply lacked the wetware, right? So language, what is language? Kevin Kelly says it's a tool that allows the mind to know what it's thinking, right? It turned a feral mind into a tool that could now think with purpose and deliberation, right? Language allowed us to create a virtual world in our heads and pull the present forward to meet that. The ability to design, to envision, to plan, to imagineer was a natural consequence to the emergence of language. Again, a tool that allows the mind to know what it's thinking, right? Language has to do with sentience. Before language, there was no self-awareness. There was no self-consciousness, right? Language came about as a kind of vortex of self-mirroring, right? It's language and self-awareness is, is kind of like plugging a video camera into the TV, aiming it at the TV, and then seeing the engulfing infinity, right? The recursive infinity loop that gets formed. And man, I don't know, I find that idea to be astonishing. And when you really think of how it transformed the mental operating system, right? You can see why Kelly would call it the first singularity. Language. I kind of want to play that as a starting point for two reasons. Because um, of words and language. If you don't have a word for something, it's really hard to describe it. And in terms of what you guys are doing in mass media, language can be words or it can be pictures or it can be connections of pictures. So what's important to remember is if you, the more tools you have to say what you're trying to think, the better stuff's going to be. So I was uh, reading about this really interesting article about the development of language and how words developed in different languages and what they worked out and um, the word red is one of the first languages one of the first words that develops in every single language um, and colors like blue come a lot later and they're trying to work that out and what they essentially worked out was if people didn't pay attention to something they didn't think of the word so the reason why red was one of the first words was it's something that didn't occur in nature, so we needed a word for that weird thing. And actually, blue didn't exist because they never said, oh, look at the sky, it's blue. They just went, oh, that's the sky. The sky is sky. You didn't need to describe it. You could only describe it as blue once the word blue had been invented. And from what I understand, the word blue was invented when they worked out a dye that could make blue. So... You know, we all know those stories about different languages don't have words. You know, Eskimos have 15 words for snow. And if you don't know the word for the snow that falls gently and melts quickly, you can't describe that unless you say 10 words. You maybe not even think about it. You know, I touched on another word a few weeks ago where Japanese don't have the word for risk. So that, that concept doesn't exist. So what's really important is you go on is try and work out the tools of words and pictures uh, that you need to move on.
So words and ideas aren't necessarily about technology, but the technology affects the word. So you can tell a story of Instagram just with pictures, but if you don't have Instagram, you can't tell that story if you've only got written words. So next video is uh, exploring that area. He grabbed his pen. He snatched his scissors. Do you know what? I'm going to stop that because I forgot to say one thing to you, which is with all the videos you're watching today, could you pay attention both to what the people are saying, but also how the story is being told through the medium of video? What are they doing? Is it a guy talking in front of the screen? Is it voiceovers? Is it whatever else? So don't just look at what you see. Analyze how you're being told this story. Ladies and gentlemen, gather around. I would love to share with you a story. Once upon a time in 19th century Germany, there was the book. Now, during this time, the book was the king of storytelling. It was venerable. It was ubiquitous. But it was a little bit boring. Because in its 400 years of existence, storytellers never evolved the book as a storytelling device. But then one author arrived, and he changed the game forever. His name was Lothar. Lothar Megendorfer. Lothar Megendorfer put his foot down, and he said, Genug ist genug. He grabbed his pen. He snatched his scissors. This man refused to fold to the conventions of normalcy and just decided to fold. History would know Lothar Megendorfer as who else? The world's first true inventor of the children's pop-up book. Yes. For this delight and for this wonder, people rejoiced. <laughs> They were happy because the story survived and that the world would keep on spinning. Lothar Megendorfer wasn't the first to evolve the way a story was told, and he certainly wasn't the last. Whether storytellers realized it or not, they were channeling Megendorfer's spirit when they moved opera to vaudeville, radio news to radio theater, film to film in motion, to film in sound, color, 3D on VHS and on DVD. There seemed to be no cure for this Megendorferitis. And things got a lot more fun when the internet came around, <laughs> because not only could people broadcast their stories throughout the world, but they can do so using with what seemed to be an infinite amount of devices. For example, one company would tell a story of love through its very own search engine. One Taiwanese production studio would interpret American politics in 3D. And one man, one man would tell the stories of his father by using a platform called Twitter to communicate the excrement his father would gesticulate. And after all this, everyone paused. They took a step back. They realized that in 6,000 years of storytelling, they've gone from depicting hunting on cave walls to depicting Shakespeare on Facebook walls. And this was a cause for celebration. The art of storytelling has remained unchanged, and for the most part, the stories are recycled. But the way that humans tell the stories has always evolved with pure, consistent novelty. And they remembered a man, one amazing German. Every time a new storytelling device popped up next, and for that, the audience, the lovely, beautiful audience. Would live happily ever after. So you get that.、Uh, oh, my computer's gone. You get that the guy there、uh, was basically using the iPad to tell a story. So that was. We were watching a film, TV show, a live event, but the guy was telling an interactive story using. I don't know if you noticed there, you know, apps. He's using Google Translate and Google World. He had, but whatever technology he used, he had a good story, and that's that's the most important thing. He probably would have been a little dull to listen to without all that stuff, but he got the audience involved. 
And so what I think is important to remember is you guys move forward, be it whether you're, you know, building technology or story about sport, is work out what are the best tools and the best words to bring your story across. Or if you're forced to use like regular video that goes up on the Vimeo or YouTube, how do you bring those tools? How do you convey that story? And so the more you understand, not just what the technology is, but what other people have done and how they've done it, that will help you along. So really that's what I want to explore in the next kind of uh, 45 minutes or so, which is really just listening to um, some creators and their stories and seeing what they've done and moving it forward. So, um, so one of the things the guy was touching on in terms of the subject matter there was how the same stories have been told for thousands and thousands of years. So, you know, if you think about a play like Shakespeare, he was telling stories, but essentially they were like the TV shows of their time 500 years ago. You know, dudes were writing books a thousand years ago, like the Iliad, and they were just telling like James Bond style movies in the best way they could. Before those books were written down, um, people would remember the equivalent of like remembering the Bible and just talk the story. So you sit around a fire every night for a week and listen to those stories. So things move on, but they stay the same. People still care about love, emotions, championships, be that war or sport. Um, you know, the kind of human emotional story. So that's where we're going. So to give us an example, um, think about The Daily Show. I don't know how many of you guys watch that or a Saturday Night Live sketch. To give a story, those kind of sketches existed 3,000 years ago. Now, I was trying to find some video to play that wasn't completely dull. So I found like the equivalent of, um, I don't know if you have York Notes, like a thing about how people did it. So they used to be these plays, and there was this guy called Aristophanes who was writing comedies in like the year, I think, 800 BC. So we're talking 3,000 years ago. Um, and this is a story, one, and it's a description of one of his stories. And if you watch it, it's a cartoon about what the guys did. You'll see how maybe it was a bit of a Daily Show sketch or a Saturday Night Live sketch of its, of its time. To put an end to the Peloponnesian War, Lysistrata persuades women from all over Greece to go on a sex strike until the men agree to make peace. Lysistrata hatches a plan with the older women to seize control of the Acropolis where the city treasury is kept. The men attempt to smoke the women out of the Acropolis, but the women extinguish the fires and triumphantly drench the men. When a magistrate, Aproboulos, arrives to retrieve funds for the war, Lysistrata berates him about the losses that the women have been forced to bear. Women have to take on more than twice your burden. Firstly, it's us giving birth to children. Then, we send them off as soldiers. The women dress the magistrate up in their clothes and send him away, humiliated. As the strike continues, the sex-starved men of Greece become increasingly desperate. A Spartan herald approaches the Acropolis and finds the magistrate outside. He explains the desperate situation of his countrymen and they both agree that a treaty is required. Delegations from Athens and Sparta meet to discuss the treaty. Lysistrata appears with her naked handmaid, Peace. The men's eyes are fixated on peace as Lysistrata chastises them for treating each other so badly and reminds them that they previously helped one another. The Spartan and Athenian leaders guiltily agree and decide on land rights to end the war. Lysistrata gives the women back to their men and joins the celebration of peace. There you have it. Um, and if you actually imagine what that would have been like, they were plays on a stage with, like you've seen amphitheaters where they're just like uh, stone steps going all the way down. All the actors were actually being dudes, but they were dudes in basically suit, and not in suits is the wrong word. Essentially think of like 
you go to a football game in like padded suits. So the men would all have padded suits with like big fake dicks, just kind of swinging between the legs, like down to the feet, uh, which they could kind of bring up. And the women would have, would basically be dudes being like fake, you know, boobs and whatever else. Um, and they all had to wear masks. So that was kind of polite, but it would have been pretty bawdy. It's a bit more like a bunch of frat house dudes putting a play on. That was kind of the vibe it got. So, so it, that was 3,000 years ago. But like, hopefully you can see it's kind of like an SNL sketch, but just, you know, they didn't, they were more open about sex and stuff like that. So it's, you know, getting blue balls to get their way. So anyway, moving on to the next bit of the story. So one of the areas I'm going to look at next is um, kind of next stage technology and how stuff is doing. So we, we're going to touch on VR later on, but I'm going to play you a clip right now. Um, we might not watch all of it because the guy's not that interesting to listen to, um, but about how books are changing because media is obviously more than just video. Explores all the solutions that will solve the climate crisis. The book starts like this. This is the cover. As the globe spins, we can see our location and we can open the book and swipe through the chapters to browse the book. Or we can scroll through the pages at the bottom. And if we want to zoom into a page, we can just open it up. And anything you see in the book, you can pick up with two fingers and lift off the page and open up. And if you want to go back and read the book again, you just fold it back up and put it back on the page. And so this works the same way, you pick it up, and pop it open. I consider myself among the majority. We look at windmills and feel they're a beautiful addition to the And so throughout the whole book, Al Gore will walk you through and explain the photos. This photo you can even see on an interactive map. Zoom into it and see where it was taken. And throughout the book, there's over an hour of documentary footage and interactive animations. So you can open this one. Most playing. modern wind turbines consist of a large... It starts playing immediately. And while it's playing, we can pinch and peek back at the page, and the movie keeps playing. Or we can zoom out to the table of contents, and the video keeps playing. But one of the coolest things in this book are the interactive infographics. This one shows the wind potential all around the United States. But instead of just showing us the information, we can take our finger and explore and see state by state exactly how much wind potential there is. And we can do the same for geothermal energy and solar power. This is one of my favorites. So this shows When the wind is blowing, any excess energy coming from the windmill is diverted into the battery. And as the wind starts dying down, any excess energy will be diverted back into the house so the lights never go out. And this whole book, it doesn't just run on the iPad. It also runs on the iPhone. And so you can start reading on your iPad in your living room and then pick up where you left off on the iPhone. It works the exact same way. You can pinch into any page, open it up. So that's uh, Pushpot Press's first title, Al Gore's Our Choice. Okay, so I kind of wanted you to take away two things from that. Number one is you need the skills to do stuff, especially uh, as you move forward. So um, I know some of you are interested in being in front of the camera, some of you are interested in doing maybe more of a technology and, and kind of CGI stuff. But if you look back to how media was like say 15 years ago, when you know, maybe your parents were at college or 20 years ago, or hopefully maybe not 15 years ago, your parents were at college, but 20, 20 years ago, um, 
like newspapers had photographers taking photographs and journalists, whereas now, you know, you're a digital media journalist and you go out with your phone, you shoot video, you put articles into a story. You know, if you're a um, camera crew on like a, uh, or if you're a crew, you know, like making a, a more regular video, maybe not a high end TV show, you're more likely, you know, when I first started in TV, you'd have a separate sound guy, a separate guy shooting, a separate producer, and maybe someone else running around. And now that might just be one or two people just because the technology is easier. The money is different. So as you move forward, try and gain as many skills in as many areas as you can. So, for example, I'm going to just say, like, you want to be a sports journalist, right? So you could learn to be a host and learn all about presenting. But actually what happens when ESPN nobody really watches on TV, they do live sports and actually it's on your tablet and you, maybe you've got to talk about what happened during college football that weekend and you're the guy that's got to put together that story. So you're doing pieces to camera, but then you've also maybe got to put together infographics about you know, who, what were the best plays, find bits of clips, maybe even do a little bit of CGI going, all right, the camera didn't capture that, but let's look at it from a different angle or you know, in a VR angle. So the more you can learn, the better equipped you're going to be to tell the story. Because the one thing that's definitely for true is people could becoming one, you know, much more one person teams or it's you and your computer and you tell your computer what you want to do, or you just learn some basic skills. Editing used to be something that people used to take years to learn on machines that cost a million dollars. And now it's like, I can go around and hang out my like eight year old niece who's just put a little video together on our iPhone. So, Technology moves forward. So the really important thing to have is a whole bunch of technical skills and being able to understand what story you want to tell and then be able to learn how to tell it or augment other people's vision. So some of you may want to be telling your own story. Some of you are going to be part of the team on bigger productions. But the more you understand the whole process. And, you know, I respot that with um, I had this host uh, who's like, I think I might have mentioned her before in the UK. She's like the Ryan Seacrest of TV. And she was stood out because she understood all the parts of the process. So she wasn't just going in front of the camera going, hey, I'm looking cute and I'm saying some cool stuff. She actually knew what the producer needed, how to keep things sharp, editorially good. She understood what all the technical people around her were doing. So she helped them do their job and it all came together to a better product. So uh, the more skills, the better. All right, so moving on, um, Rick's, this is a slightly longer video, but I think it might be of interest. This is about where technology may be going. So this is a little bit more kind of pie in the sky, but I want you to be thinking about stuff like this. There isn't a culture that's ever existed on the planet, as far as we know, that doesn't tell stories. And technology has always been integral in that communication. We often find new ways to tell stories that we really like. In the same way that when they first started moving pictures, and they didn't quite know what it was going to look like to tell a story with moving pictures, but they knew it was really cool to make those pictures move, that's the place that I feel like we're at with digital and built worlds. What's interesting about alternate worlds like fantasy, like science fiction, like alternate history, is that they're thought experiments about the way the world could be. And I think this kind of project is perfect for this kind of world. Intel Labs and the USC World Building Media Lab got together because we wanted to see what would happen. If we actually built these digital worlds, could stories begin to actually emerge out of them? Could you create environments that were rich enough and interesting enough that people could have compelling story experiences inside these landscapes? The original Leviathan by Scott Westerfeld, it's a trilogy that reimagines World War I in a landscape where you can create your own animals. The military at the time has turned those animals into creatures of war. And so the Leviathan is a giant floating whale. And that's the world that we decided to create. Scott as an author is fascinated by and really enjoys the idea of creating a platform and then seeing what other people are gonna do inside that platform. The Leviathan series is basically about this collision between technologies. So I think that using new technologies to tell that story kind of makes sense. 
for me, the integration of technology and story is long and interesting. And now we're creating digital environments, which are actually real places. They're robust and they're rule-driven, and you can walk into a place and be inside that place and have it behave according to its own rules. I've been in the film industry for about 35 years, and as the designer, my responsibility was uh, to create the context for the story. It suddenly became more like creating something that looked much more like a world. And what we observed was that the world itself started giving back and stimulating and provoking different reactions in the story space. The challenge that we had from Tony and from Intel was how could we imagine the next step of storytelling? World building evolved almost directly out of the realization that the linear process was not strictly relevant when you had these immersive tools. We took a small collection of film students, a small collection of game students, and basically locked them in a room together and told them they had to collaborate, which turns out to be really difficult. Film students and film is based on tremendous visual control. Games are about participation. They're about, in many cases, total freedom of the audience to do whatever they want. And so what we really did is try to take those two worlds and make them begin to combine together. One of the things that's really unique about being in an interactive media and games program that is in the cinema school at USC is that you have people that are able to think in really compelling ways about storytelling as a system, but also about games as a system. We have these powerhouse students who are absolutely hungry for exploring the space of their imagination. So we can move really rapidly, I think, in very unconventional ways. A lot of our work actually here in the lab, we focus on lower resolution rendering. We have to limit ourselves to stories that we can tell with high-end but available compute. Because for our experimentation, the real value of having the students here is that they are so hungry to tell this new kind of story. We want to give them tools today, not sort of promise them tools tomorrow. In 2013, what we were using is just a combination of sort of daisy chain together desktop servers to drive the world in the background and Core i7 high compute tablets, head mounted displays, traditional game consoles and traditional game controllers. Everything we use is off the shelf. So what we're looking at here is the augmented reality experience of the Leviathan project. Here we have a projection screen and the grayscale image of the border around it is actually a marker which a camera on an Intel Ultrabook can recognize. And when it recognizes the pattern, it can actually register its point in space. So here we have a shot of the Leviathan entering the space, but then it's gonna to transition to an augmented reality mode where an audience member can pick up an Ultrabook, can point it at the screen and register the marker. Then we can make the whale fly out of the traditional cinematic two-dimensional screen and fly into the audience space itself. So every time you build out the world, you also create space for more story. That's one of the things about world building that's really fascinating, is it gives you narrative. The Huxley was something that I just sort of threw into the books. The Media Lab has done a whole set of things where you can control a Huxley, you can sort of guide them, and, and make this. So, so it's one of the major game elements in the technologies they're creating. So it's been kind of cool to see something that is a, you know, a bit character, a side character in my book become a really important part just because they found the idea interesting and they found it visually fascinating. Working with Intel is very interesting when we're in this kind of fluid, creative, imaginative space because you've got a great tension between the pragmatism of, <laughs> of engineering and maybe the push that we can provide here, which is the why, the why, the what if, and the why, that, that and push and pull, they, they inform each, each other in a really balanced way. The great strength, strength of this relationship, relationship is that we are at the center, center of, of the next generation, generation of storytellers. Well, 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 well. Okay. I don't know what's happened on that clip, but uh, it's only got like 30 seconds left, so I'm guessing the guy's just going to wrap up. So, um, let me try one more time, hold on. In the center of the narrative. Yeah, okay, hold on. I'll just play the last few seconds of that. Media city in the world. So, it's a very powerful place to be looking at a future that we cannot quite imagine, but we can sort of prepare ourselves for. 
I think the future of storytelling is an entertainment ecosystem in which I get an opportunity to step into that world, to play in that world and really be in that world. And we've actually got these incredible new story containers and we're just beginning to see what stories might emerge from them. So I'd probably say two things around that. Number one, I think interactive storytelling is part of the future, but I don't think all storytelling, storytelling is going to be like that because there's always going to be an element of someone just having a story and you listening to what story they have to say, someone interesting at a bar or whatever else. But um, I actually went to that project and did a, a, like a weekend, what they call 5D world building. So one of the really interesting areas that's come out of gaming technology, which, which – kind of not, hadn't happened before is what you may describe there as world building. So it used to always be that maybe you had an idea and it was like telling a story of like, uh, we can look at some clips later of the Martian, what happens when you go to Mars. Um, someone has a story they want to tell, but what comes out of gaming? And so from The Sims or our other worlds, if you think about The Sims, and maybe it's a really good example, is you create a world and then that world starts telling you stories. So say you create a world and you decide that bigger buildings get blown up or it's really earthquake prone. It starts telling you stories. So if that was the real world and that was LA, and LA was a sim city, it's a city where it's affected by earthquakes, uh, fires, and big events. You know, One of the stories we went to and we looked at was what happens to LA? if seawater levels rise by like 50 feet and then it, you know the only part of LA that's left is like Beverly Hills and some of the other mountains and then the more you go into it the more you work out well the subways won't work the rich people are going to try and protect their land the poor people won't have jobs does that mean a whole bunch of people are going to be living on boats oh suddenly we've got this boat city of poor underprivileged people who are maybe fishing and and have hassle with the rich people, the world starts telling you a story and then you kind of go down that route. So it's a different way of instigating a story and you can go into those story worlds where you discover your own story based on the world that's been created or you can follow a story that's kind of been written in that world. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. Anyone got any questions so far? Yeah. Uh, Hold on. Can you hear it? Can yeah. Oh, maybe I can't actually. No, you can't. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I muted the microphone. Oh, no, no, it was not muted. You can hear it. Well, I can hear you, Andre, but not. Closer. What was the uh, context to the Leviathan project? Like, what were they selling? What Was it a school project or what was it? Uh, from my knowledge, it's just a thought piece. So it's Intel trying to work out what they do with the technology. It's USC, which has a pretty pretty their film school has a pretty big film grant so it's probably money that's come from like movie studios come from technologists um and comes from just the money they have to try and explore new areas a lot of, i mean essentially a lot of those kind of high-end universities are research universities where they they kind of do blue sky thinking like the equivalent of google moonshots with education they have the money they just explore where the world might go and that's what they're doing Okay. All right, so we've spoken a little bit about stories, um, and I'm going to play one really short clip, actually. Uh... Story time. She then discovered a booger residing in her nose. It would never be removed. Story time. He ripped into the bagel ravenously as if tearing into the carcass of a dead gazelle. Dude. Story time. She stared at the gown and thought, yes, this is something my husband would wear. <laughs> Story time. <laughs> so it's really stupid and that goes on a bit. What I wanted to play back to was number one, it's telling stories on vines. So each of those was like a six second clip. Um, but he told a story in six seconds. Each one of those things was, and it's really simple. It was a visual and he put words on that gave it a completely different meaning. So always think of your pictures as one tool. Think of words and audio and music as another tool. Um, and you can make things simple and effective. So don't always try to overcomplicate things. All right. So for the next 
bit of the lesson, or actually to the end of the lesson, I'm going to. I found three different story, t- three different storytellers, and we're just kind of going to listen to them and see where their thoughts are by way of inspiration. So I'm going to play you a clip of each one. Well, actually, the first you have a separate clip, and then I'll just play you a video of the, the person talking, uh, one, of them, one of the ones that's got clips built in. I guarantee you that at some point, everything's going to go south on you. Ready? And you're going to say, this is it. This is how I end. Commander, Mark is dead. We have to go. Now you can either accept that, or you can get to work. This will come as quite a shock to my crewmates, and to NASA, and to the entire world. But I'm still alive. Surprise. Here's the rub. It's going to be four years for another mission to reach me. And I'm going to have design to last 31 days. So I got to make water and grow food on a planet where nothing grows. But if I can't figure out a way to make contact with NASA, then none of this matters anyway. We've got an incoming message. Mein Gott. <laughs> Mark Watney is still alive. Woo! In your face, Neil Armstrong. There must be some kind of way out of here. Okay, so let's do the math. I have enough food to last for 50 days. He's going to starve to death long before we can help. Him. So, I'm gonna have to science the shit out of this. He's 50 million miles away from home. He's totally alone. What the hell is he thinking right now? I am the greatest botanist on this planet. I know how to save Mark Watney. But we need the Hermes crew. We either have a high chance of killing one or a low chance of killing six. I'm not risking their lives. It's bigger than one person. No. It's not. NASA rejected the mission. So if we do this? We're talking mutiny. If anything goes wrong, we die. Do you realize how crazy this is? We have no other option. No matter what happens, tell the world, tell my family, and I never stop fighting to make it home. So we're going to talk or listen to one of the story makers just to put it into context. The movie was directed by a guy called Ridley Scott, who did Gladiator and Blade Runner, amongst others. It was based on an e-book, and the guy we're listening to is the guy who wrote the movie script. He's also a producer, and so uh, one of the things he's done recently is Marvel on Netflix. So. We're going to explore a little bit about his creative processes right now. How closely did you work with Andy on this project? And, and do you, was it quite helpful to have him kind of involved? Or sometimes do you prefer just to say, right, I need to do this on my own accord? Well, you know, every project is different. But with The Martian, uh, I, I love this book so much, you know. And, and one of the first things I did when it was, it, it was a blog. It started when Andy was just giving away this book for free on the internet. And we called him and said, look, your life's about to change. You know, you, you can quit your day job because he was still working at his day job. And, you know, I, I didn't want to do this movie without Andy's help and blessing. Cause it, it, and also, he's much smarter than me. So that helped. <laughs> Because, yeah, I mean, it is so kind of, it's very intellectual and it all feels very authentic and very scientific. And I didn't once say, oh, that wouldn't happen. I was very, I abided by it the whole way through. But how, how do you go about ensuring the film remains accessible and entertaining to people who, a lot of this does sort of go over their heads, like myself? <laughs> yeah, I, that was sort of my job. Because, you know, Andy got the science right. And, and my job was to just make it into an entertaining movie. And, and so I would just work away. And try to shape the book, and then when I when I get into a place I thought Andy'd be happy with it, I'd send it to him, and he'd say, "Okay, uh, you screwed this up," and then he'd fix my science for me. 
And I mean, when you write a great, a great screenplay, do you not think sometimes, man, I really want to do this one myself? <laughs> or does it sometimes get to the point when Ridley Scott says, well, I'm interested, you just go, well, if you're interested, Ridley, this one's probably for you. You know, Ridley is my favorite director of all time. So when he says yes, you just step out of the way. <laughs> uh, but when, when you were writing um, the screenplay, did you ever, was, was it, did you know originally that Ridley might come on board? Or did you go back and kind of, um, change it slightly when you knew that he was on board to kind of suit his sort of sensibilities as a filmmaker. Yeah, once Ridley came aboard, he sort of had his own spin and take on it and we'd work together to sort of craft it. Yeah. And can we expect to see you sort of direct again soon? Because so far, sort of Cabin in the Woods is a 100% track record. <laughs> yeah, nowhere to go but down, right? <laughs> no, that, that's the plan. I mean, I, I don't, you know. It's it's tricky getting movies together, but uh, I would imagine I'll be directing again soon. Yeah, and when uh, watching the movie, I mean, it's such a a kind of fantastic tale that takes you through all the kind of emotions as an audience member. Are you able to to get immersed in the tale despite the fact you wrote it? Can you can you watch it and and really get into it and kind of feel emotion when you need to feel emotion? Was that a bit too difficult when you're the man behind the screenplay? No, I, certainly with this movie, I, and part of it's because I just love the book so much, and I, the book resonated emotionally with me. I watched this movie and. I I burst into tears every time. It's always in a different place, you know, each time I watch it, because there's something new I notice each time. But I, I find this movie to be very sort of emotionally heart, you know, heart rending. And in regards to uh, NASA's involvement, I mean, obviously they, they did play a big part in this. I was just wondering if that was, if they were involved in, in your sort of aspect of, of the, the writing process. When I was writing, I would go, I went to JPL, which is in Pasadena, and I'd go to NASA and just tour uh, there. And so much of what they taught me went into the movie directly. And then once we got the script to a place, we'd sent it to them and they, they made sure I didn't screw up too much. <laughs> What's important about that one as well is that the, he's probably one of the visionaries behind it, but he's working with a bunch of other visionaries. So collaboration is a really important part of the process. Um, Ridley Scott is obviously really famous and has a vision. This guy in his own right as a writer has lots of fans and lots of people just rate his work. So the obviously work, you know, they shared a sensibility and worked together and you know had a story they want to tell and moved it so i'm moving on to an next clip actually now so it's completely different this is about documentary and what i really like about this one and the reason why i picked it was this isn't this is as much a piece of art or a piece of um creative work in its own right um as much as it is a documentary so i'm going to play you a, a clip or a trailer for the documentary and then i'm gonna we're gonna listen to the director I was underdeveloped, immature little dude that never got laid. Kurt's brain was constantly going. You go out for a few hours, you come back, and there was a painting on the wall, and he wrote a song. He hated being humiliated. You'd see the rage come out. This is what I've always wanted to do. And I said, you are not ready for this. He wanted to build a home. If anything's going to stop me, pursuing rock and roll is going to be hurt. We were all we had. He was searching for whatever made him feel like he wasn't alone. Are you getting all this? Yes. From the moment Kurt Cobain bursts into the public scene with Smells Like Teen Spirit, there has been an absolute obsession, cultural obsession with Kurt. But Kurt had very limited interactions with media during his lifetime. And so the public's perception of Kurt, for the most part over the course of the last 25 years, has been heavily steeped in mythology and projection and fantasy. And with Montage of Heck, for the first time, audiences are going to meet Kurt Cobain. It's a immersive ride through Kurt's life. Kurt's archives are stored in a storage facility. And he had the paintings laid out and whatnot. And as I started to open the boxes, each box was like another story or another layer. I'm sort of immersed in this Cobain world. And I see this tape, it was tape 58 called Montage of Heck. And I put it in. I have my headphones on and I have a team of people working around me and whatnot. And suddenly I was transported. I hear this tape and it felt like a portal into Kurt's mind. 
you literally go through life with Kurt Cobain in this film. And you go through it through his eyes and through his experience. And um, that's really rare in a documentary to have that level of documentation. But it was a combination of both the mother keeping everything and Kurt creating art constantly throughout his life. He probably created one of the most comprehensive audiovisual autobiographies of anyone in my generation. And so it was a unique opportunity to do something that's never been done, which is present an American icon, a revered American icon, in a completely naked and honest manner, without tearing him down and without building him up, but where we can look him in the eye. Okay, so what's interesting about that one as well, um, and it is really interesting if you haven't seen it, is that director is kind of well known for having his own vision, but you know, it's how do you mix the fact that he's got a vision, a story he wants to tell, a way he likes telling a story, but it's got to be led by the material. So essentially, you know, it's like one of those challenges in a TV show. You're stuck in a room with a door locked, and you've just got a bunch of material, and you've got to make something work from that. How, you know, how do you pick a story? How do you pick the materials? How do you give it some of your own magic that makes it into a, a special kind of project? So if you get a chance to look at it, what he did was he mixed old footage he had, created new interviews, but you saw there there's an awful lot of animation. So he took his artwork and had it animated and created cartoons and tried to get inside the mind of him. So he was really creatively using tools. He wasn't getting some voice out of the guy going, Kurt was really like this. And um, he kind of let the footage and the material and Kurt's own work tell the story. All he did was kind of augment it to make it a little bit more visual. So, um, all right. Next one is a really different kind of story. We're kind of going a little bit political or only mildly political. And the reason why I'm playing this one is to show there are different ways of telling a story. The movie, uh, I'm actually talking about Selma, could have been a documentary and it probably would have been the kind of thing that you might watch on PBS or maybe not watch on PBS because you might think it's a little bit dumb with some 50 year old guy just kind of droning on about how important it was. Sometimes you just need to get the emotion of the movie. So um, this is what we're going to next. So we've got one of the actors and the director. Detroit, New York, Los Angeles, inciting large-scale arrests and sympathy marches. I'm very aware of that, Mr. Hoover. What I do know is nonviolent. What I need to know right now, what's Martin Luther King about to do next? Mr. President, Dr. King is here. <laughs> what a journey it's been, right? Uh, uh, okay. Jamal, you want to say that for me, please? Jamal Finkley, Black Tree TV. Jamal, Jamal. This is a proud moment for me, you know, <laughs> just to just to sit here across from you guys and after seeing this movie last night, and mm. I gotta tell you, the movie moved us so much that that a bunch of us journalists got together and it's like we decided on how we was gonna fight our treatment by the studios and everything. Mm. It was like, it, it inspired us to do mm. the demonstrate and everything else. So, Good, so you guys are going to protest? We're going to protest. You should. Mm. Yes. You should. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Let me so, know how I can help. Okay. Yes. So yes. first, I mean, why, why Selma? Martin Luther King had so many chapters of his of his life, his story that, that meant so much, even posthumously. Mm. Why why was Selma like the, the focal point for this story for you? I think the, the thing that attracted us to this story is, uh, is that you could talk about the life of, of King without having to go cradle to the grave. Because mm -hmm. it's too much. His life was episodic. You had his early life. When he met, you know, the, the, the son of, of, of two, the son of a preacher, the grandson of a preacher, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, um, his, his life in Boston, uh, his life in Montgomery with the bus boycott, uh, the I Have a Dream, the March on Washington, all of those, they're all movies. Mm -hmm. So once you said we're not going to go cradle to the grave, we're going to go a slice of life, then that decision lets you, lead you to a which, which life, which part of it. Mm -hmm. And Selma is just so robust. Mm -hmm. I mean, that time was a time when he was hitting on all um, cylinders strategically, or um, um, as an orator, as an organizer, um, but it's also some of the lowest moments he had personally. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's fascinating. Three months. Yeah, 
Yeah. And and you embodying that character, I mean, it's a, it's a lot that, that you had to pull off. But I, I imagine from reading these speeches and, and just trying to embody the character, like, spiritually, it had to, like, feel some, a certain way to you, I would imagine. Like, how was, how was taking on the character of Dr. King? Well, what you say there is key, you know, the, the spiritual connection to it. Because if you see Dr. King giving those speeches, you know that he is operating in something other, you know, and, the, and the, the, the reason you really see that is when you then see him not in the pulpit, not, you know, in, in that uh, uh, higher state that he's in when he's giving some of those speeches. And uh, so, so that was a lot of the work I had to do is to position myself where that was even possible. It was kind of a gamble because you never know. But what I never wanted it to feel like is just a technically proficient performance. It's like, how do you even come close to how transcendental he was in the pulpit with those speeches? And how do you then show the man behind those speeches when he's with his wife, when he's with his brothers, when he's, you know, suffering under the weight of the guilt and the expectation that this campaign placed upon him? So that was the, 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 the duality that we had to had to find really and thankfully had a, a great captain to get me there and a great actor i mean just sitting here with them the way he looks the way he speaks right yeah that ain't king yeah. you know what i mean like yeah. that that is a a performance of really epic proportions he yeah. he transformed himself I, I uh it's it's nuts even i'm sitting here listening to you i'm like my boy's wicked smart <laughs> you know what i mean you know what i mean it's like i'm like Ugh, that sounds good david so yeah I, I think, uh, and, and Kama said this, that, that he wanted to play a superhero before, but <laughs> but now you feel like he played a superhero without having a superhero oh, costume. Wow, that's I wonderful. think we all know that how brave Dr. King was, and, and, and all those people, John Lewis, everybody, but I think to see that he wasn't always 100% confident, mm. I think was a, a nuance. I mean, mm. did, did you, was that, what, what was some other nuances you learned about King just from taking on this this campaign. Yeah, I mean that guilt and that and that the fact that he felt very guilty during this time. This is the the, the only time in all of his campaigns where people died and actually mm -hmm. three people died. Um, and it's under his watch, so to speak, you know, and of course it's the fault of the racists who did it. But ultimately it was because they were waging a campaign that he was heading and so that guilt, that pressure, which David, um, you know, uh, inserts beautifully into the performance. But then also just the little things like, look, at some point in the film, you just see a black man and a black woman having a hard time at home, mm. right? Brother has to take out the trash. He has to answer some hard questions. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, just just that. You think of King and Coretta. You think of Mrs. King, you know, and, and you think of him. And you don't think about the marriage. That's what I wanted to get into. Right, it's like right. the marriage, black love, and what that is under pressure. Yeah. And so that was really important to me to to, to get into, uh, to, into the script, into the film. And, you know, David can do anything, so you can throw anything at him. And, you know, literally, that performance, you know, you're giving speeches, you yeah. know, at the state capitol. And then you know you're in the kitchen with your wife and to be able to do those at such a high level fantastic bravo to you both and uh you know i'm just proud I'm what proud about black see. tree though can we talk about how much i love black tree <laughs> I, can we talk about black tree tv and how long that i've known you Man. since you were first starting black tree yeah. and we were getting you on junk hits and you could barely get a slot and i'm convincing people but it's real this black tree and his youtube he what is the, the stat the it's highest over rated, half a billion or so half high. a billion on youtube yeah. i mean it, he's the mo truly the most wow. powerful i would say the most widely seen broadcast outlet for for dedicated to black entertainment wow. film black film i mean wow. am i am i right you're and right. this guy who's <laughs> continued just with a real integrity about it. Anyway, I'm proud of you. Proud I can't of believe you. we're sitting here. I can't believe we're sitting it's here. It's a great moment. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So you got a bit of an idea there where at the very beginning you saw that that wasn't just a story. You got people politically motivated. So, you know, movies can be very, very powerful. Um, I was going to play you one more clip, which is a little lighter, but actually I'm not going to. I'm going to save it for another lesson. Um, because we're due to finish in a couple of minutes. So um, anyone got any questions or thoughts or want to, you know, have a discussion about filmmakers and, you know, what, what kind of filmmaker or... Of course, like, like when the writers get together and talk about story, like how many times does the story actually change? Over time? Like I know there are different visions, so like how many times do you think the story actually changes throughout the uh, process? Uh, that I don't, I mean, it's kind of like saying how long is a piece of string, but 
but it easily a dozen or more times. And then also it would depend where it would end up. So a writer may do like say four versions of a script and then it might go to a different writer to give like a, like a producer may take it on board and go, eh, it's not quite the way I like it. I really like 80% of all this guy's done, but I need to make it say a little more emotional. And that writer that originally did it doesn't do good emotion. So it goes to writer who's good at emotions. And then it might kind of be that that producer then takes a script and goes, Warners or participant might say, hey, we might fund that. Oh, it might be a Brad Pitt movie. Oh, then suddenly you've got to turn it into like a bigger, more spectacular movie. Maybe the budget goes up, so you change where the backgrounds are. I mean, budget also is a really important thing to remember that, um, say you want to view Star Wars, that's expensive because it's in loads of places. You know, some movies are shot in like three or four places, like maybe in a couple of rooms or in one town. So you might kind of go, hey, this is right now a, a $50 million shoot over 50 days. Um, but we need to turn it into a $25 million shoot over 30 days and all in the southeast and loads of the money is going to go to our actors rather than money is going to go on screen. So then you rewrite the script again. And then obviously the, the really last part of it is you shoot a bunch of stuff and then you go to the edit suite and you're kind of rewriting the movie in the edit suite. Every word that gets put down doesn't end up on screen. Sometimes you drop out whole scenes because they're confusing, they don't work, the actors didn't work. So I'd say it's a constant process. No right or wrong answer, but it's never, it's never like you write it once and it gets made, unless it's like you and your buddy doing it and you just go off and start shooting it. Um, but, you know, if you're doing um, something on, on TV and you're doing a news article, you might not have any time to rewrite something or, you know, do a basic script for a news story or... Um, you know, you put something more simple together, you might just have to go and do it and kind of see what happens. So lots of times is the answer and for lots of reasons, not just creative, but budget reasons or, you know, rewriting a document. That same montage of heck, if that was going to be on MTV, that would have been a whole different documentary. And if they paid for it, the guy would have had to go back and kind of change what he was going to do. Um, and the same with Selma. I'm sure that changed when Ava DuVernay came on board as a director and she wants to bring out more of the emotional story, but I've read in other places. And then obviously, you know, they get certain actors involved and it became more of a, you know, more of a, with David Oliello, I can never say his name properly. Um, when he came on board, suddenly it's going to be more like Oscar Bay than maybe like a, a worthy movie. So then again, you might change it. So, yeah. Anyone for anything else? Cool. All right. We'll have a great rest of the day, guys.